All right, uh, so we were talking about rheumatologic conditions, talking about osteoarthritis kind of in parallel with that, talking about treatment. We know about our DMARDs. We know about the differences between biologic and traditional DMARDs, et cetera. Um, Cetaminophen, very good mainstay of therapy for osteoarthritis, uh, mainly because it doesn't have a lot of the side effects you see with the NSAIDs, right? So, but what do you have to think about with acetaminophen? What toxicities? Hepatotoxicity, right? So you want to make sure if you have a patient with like chronic alcoholism or cirrhosis or anything like that, they're going to be more prone to get that toxicity. So their levels, uh, the doses they receive need to be lower than what you would see with someone else with, you know, no other conditions. Uh, just be aware of that, you know, but relatively safe. You can use it on a scheduled basis, but anyone know like the max dose you should receive in a day? Yeah, it really shouldn't exceed four grams, but even some patients, four grams a day every single day can still see some rises in their LFTs, so, right? So you have to be careful with that and make sure you're asking about how much are they getting. If they're also on opioids that contain acetaminophen, you have to ask about all sources of Tylenol, so it's really important to get a good sense of that, make sure they're not getting above that four grams a day. So uh, we also have some topical analgesics. What's the benefit of using topical therapy here? No, it's systemic toxicity for the most part, right? Um, topical NSAIDs can be really good, especially if it's just like one joint being affected or a relatively small number of joints being affected. Um, what's kind of the downsides of topical products? They can be effective, right? But, you know, not good for like really diffuse disease. Like, so if it's kind of all over, a lot of joints are being affected, it may not be as effective from that standpoint. Hmm? Yeah, so you can see some skin irritation, right? See some dermatitis. Hmm? Compliance, why compliance? Yeah, if it's like greasy feeling or if it stains your clothes and all those kind of things, right? So again, it's much easier just to pop a pill, but it may not be the, the best treatment for them, right? Um, and again, think about NSAIDs, who are NSAIDs not really good for. We think about renal patients. We think about patients with uh, GI history. You know, if they have cardiac issues, maybe that could be playing a role, right? So there's lots of reasons why you may not always use an NSAID. Using a topical product would be really good in that case. The onset for Voltaren gel? Uh, it works pretty quick, yeah. So it's not going to be, you know... It doesn't take as long as something like capsaicin, as we'll talk about, you know, or do we ever talk about capsaicin? Yeah, we did. Yeah, that one takes a while because you have to deplete that substance P, but this one's going to be able to work a little bit faster than that, for sure. Yeah, so Voltaren gel, you can use it for like minor aches and pains and stuff, and it works pretty well for that. Um, there's also like salicylate-based products like Asper cream. Those are fine to use as well. Um, as I mentioned, capsa uh, capsaicin, what was the thing to think about with capsaicin? Wash your hands really good, right? Just with regular water. Soap and water, right? You need some kind of surfactant to kind of uh, break up that oil. What else? Um, you have to be consistent. Yes, you must be consistent. You have to use it the same way every single day. Otherwise, if you stop using it if, uh, like you should, then it's gonna, the pain's going to come right back, right? So just be aware of that. Um, there's other things. You can use like countering your tins like, you know, um, oil wintergreen, camphor, menthol. You know, there's different options that are out there, and sometimes you'll see them um, being included in, you know, a combination of products. This is where you get things like your Bengays and, um, you know, uh, Icy Hot, things like that, right? They're countering your tins to cause kind of this kind of cold heat sort of sensation um, that kind of, uh, draw some of that that, uh, that soreness away from it. So the, the questionable efficacy, but it could be useful adding on to something else. And then we always have intraarticular corticosteroids. This is not going to be recommended all the time, all the way throughout the year. You really don't want to go more than, say, um, more than every three months because you can actually see kind of accelerated joint destruction um, by applying those corticosteroids. They're very effective at dealing with that inflammation, dealing with the pain, um, but it really should be used more sort of uh, intermittently, again, not more than every three months. And the second line for osteoarthritis is opioids. Obviously, the ideal dose of opioids a patient should be receiving is zero, right? We, ideally, we'd like to do that. It may not always be the case, though. And again, if, patient, if you're not adequately treating your patient's pain, what are they going to do? They might go to someone else or going to find some way to treat that pain, right? So again, they may rely on things like illicit substances and may you know, go to providers who may be uh, not as uh, well-educated and, and, and as uh, effective as you guys will be. Um, so again, you want to make sure they're getting well-treated with you and make sure to, to describe like why you were maybe hesitant to give opioids. What are some of the downsides of using opioids, right? They're effective, but there's a lot of things you have to worry about it, like the physical dependence, the tolerance, the, you know, the addiction, the side effects, et cetera, right? So just something to consider. Anyway, uh, some other things you can maybe do, this may help to maybe slow down progression of disease, but glucosamine and chondroitin, you know, these are available as uh, dietary supplements. So again, be somewhat wary when you're going through and looking at the different brand names. They are not under the same scrutiny as FDA approved products. So you may find if you go to get like, you know, I don't know, the bottom, you know, bottom of the barrel 
sort of cheap discount glucosamine chondroitin. It may not be the same quality as something that you pay a little bit more money for, right? So again, some of it can be um, kind of you get what you pay for. But um, basically, they're trying to help kind of slow down the uh, uh, you know, joint destruction, trying to kind of help restore a little bit of that articular lining um, as best it can. Um, again, there's no like kind of home run sort of out of the park kind of like, yes, this stuff works, it's going to save your joints. It can kind of help out a little bit, but you know, it's not going to be the end all, you know, be all of the osteoarthritis therapy. Um, but relatively safe. The one thing I would consider, um, I mentioned the dietary supplement issue, but also uh, some patients, uh, anyone know where the glucosamine chondroitin actually come from? The glucosamine. Uh, glucosamine comes from like I think shark cartilage, and the chondroitin I believe comes from like um, some kind of shellfish-based product. I believe it's like the shells of, of oysters or something like that. But um, not so important. But the thing to to know if they do have a, a pretty strong shellfish allergy, you may want to be careful of them using glucosamine and chondroitin product. They usually come together as one product, so again, it's hard to discern in which one they're having a reaction to. But most of the time, it's that shellfish allergy that'll get you. So you want to be careful of that. Okay. We also do things like inject hyaluronate into the actual joints themselves, so this can be somewhat useful. Um, you know, hyaluronate is, is a normal constituent of, of synovial fluid anyway, and so this kind of helps to replace some of that that may be lost and also have some anti-inflammatory properties as well. Um, this is good because it's relatively free of side effects, and you'll see the same issue that you see with intraarticular corticosteroids. So this could be used throughout the year. You could be getting it more regularly than something like, you know, uh, triamcinolone intraarticularly. So this could be something to consider. Anytime you're doing intraarticular injections, what do you want to consider? Infection, Infection yeah, because again, it's kind of a protected site. So if it gets infected, it gets you know, septic pretty easily. And so you have to make sure you're using sterile fields and everything to make sure that that stays clean. Very good. So again, looking at um, kind of the the flow chart of how you would manage these patients here. So again, looking first off is I mean, acetaminophen contraindicated. So who would that be? They like have a like very significant uh, liver disease. Who else might be? They have an allergy to it, right? So they couldn't receive. I've never seen anyone with a tyro allergy, but you never know. Um, so then, if not, like, yeah, start off with that. Like, it's going to be kind of your go-to, you know, drug there for the most part. Because again, it's the kind of the safest out of the whole bunch there. Uh, and it's cheap. You know, you can get it from anywhere. Like I said, you can go to Costco and get the 55-gallon drum for like you know five bucks or something, right? Um, other things to consider: they couldn't take Tylenol. Let's try some topical products, right? If it's just their knee, their left knee is bothering them. Try some topical products, some topical Voltaire and some capsaicin, something like that can be totally effective as well. And, and then considering if it's getting more progressive, considering things like, you know, intraarticular corticosteroids, things like that. Um, you know, tramadol could be considered, tramadol's kind of, I don't know if it's going by the wayside or not, but, you know, more people were starting to abuse it. It's a controlled substance now. Um, so, again, I would not use that as my first line, um, but certainly could consider as kind of maybe not being as quite as heavy duty as other opioids like oxycodone. It could be an alternative. Um, and, again, obviously, you know, what's the best thing you could do for those patients? If the joint's are completely worn out, replace it, all right? So that could be a really big thing that could help them out. But you never know, a lot of comorbid conditions may be blocking that. Um, you know, I tell you, my mother, she had both of her knees uh, replaced over probably a uh, 12 month period, um, but she's got a host of other health issues. She had AFib, she's got hypertension, diabetes, et cetera. And so a lot of it came down to, okay, well, I have to have like a, a thousand doctor's visits just to get cleared, just to get the surgery. And then she goes in for surgery that one day and then guess what? Her hemoglobin was like 0.1 lower than what it they were shooting for. And they said, nope, I'm not gonna do it. And they're like, really? You know, through all of that, and then just this one time today. Anyway, so again, so, but now the knees are replaced. Feeling a lot better, right? So again, that's usually what uh, it will come down to, but it could be a question of costs, comorbid conditions, et cetera. Um, in some cases, you may find some benefit using duloxetine. We'll talk about that later on in the behavioral section. It's actually going to be an SNRI, or selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. We'll talk about that later. It's good for a neuropathic sort of pain, but um, those are kind of your options, right? A lot of patients end up on opioids because their pain is not adequately managed with some of these other uh, medications, but um, again, we like to hold off on that as best we can, right? I'm not going to tell you one of those people who are like, never give opioids, but if you can spare it, if you don't have to, because these are going to be chronic pain patients, right? So again, when you kind of move that step from acute to chronic, like a whole host of issues, right? So things to consider. And for hand um, osteoarthritis, again, you know, topical products can be very nice because of the fact that they can help to limit that systemic toxicity of other products. Um, but again, looking at things like, you know, NSAIDs can be useful. Um, be considerate of their age though, right? The older they get, the less likely they are gonna be able to handle the NSAIDs uh, quite as well. So those might be patients you might wanna consider not using those in. Um, yeah, and combination therapy is always gonna be recommended. You know, if you wanna have a patient who's taking Tylenol and an NSAID, they can kind of cycle off between them. Sometimes that can be more effective, just depends on the patient. Okay, so any questions on that?
Alright, getting into osteoporosis and osteomalacia. What is this? What is osteoporosis? You guys covered it? Yeah. Talked about it? What is it? Oh. The, yeah, so the bones are wearing away, right? You know, we're, what, what's, the, what's the big risk with osteoporosis? Fractures, right? What kind of fractures? Femur, Femur fractures. Hip fractures. Vertebral fractures, right? You know, ever notice like old people when they get older and older and older, they get shorter and shorter and shorter, right? Yeah. Those little micro uh, vertebral fractures, right? Um, yeah, so this is a, a big issue, especially in uh, more elderly individuals. Who else do we have to think about this in predominantly? Postmenopausal women, why? Estrogen is a pro bone effect, right? So it's good on the bones, and when you lose that estrogen, you end up losing that effect, and the bones typically take a hit, right? Who else might be predominantly? Hmm? Like hyperparathyroidism. Yeah, hyperparathyroidism. Why might someone have hyperparathyroidism? Tumor. Could be a tumor. What else? What if they have bad dietary intake? Okay. They don't have good vi uh, vitamin D and calcium intake. They could have hyperparathyroidism. What else? Renal patients you're going to find with chronic kidney disease. Didn't we talk about that last semester? Mm -hmm. Right? We talked about how they get that renal osteomalacia that occurs there because of the fact that their phosphate and calcium are not being able to be maintained. They bind up together. And then they can't produce vitamin D because where does vitamin D get ultimately activated? In the kidneys, right? So again, these are the people you want to be thinking about with this. Um, and again, that predisposition for fractures is a big deal because what happens to old people once they get a fracture? It goes downhill pretty quick, right? Because again, they can't get around, the mobility goes down, they're not going to be they get, you know, at risk for all kinds of problems, right? They're laid in a bed all the time, they get a decubitus ulcer, and they, it, it's bad. So you, ideally, you want to keep the patient from getting a fracture in the first place, because again, you do see mortality and morbidity go up pretty significantly after one of those fractures, right? And again, think about what other medications might they be on, things like, you know, stuff for their blood pressure, right? Orthostatic hypotension develops. Guess what? They're also going to be more likely to have a fall, right? And then they fracture their little brittle uh, the brittle bones, right? So these are things to think about. Anyway, there's medications that are certainly associated with osteoporosis. I kind of um, highlighted just a few of them. There's a lot of them that are out there, but most of them kind of come down to the fact that um, if you mess with the steroids in the body, you're typically going to have some negative effects on the bones. And I'll give you a few examples. So, for instance, aromatase inhibitors. Aromatase, anyone remember what that's useful for? Estrogen. Yeah, it actually actually converts things like uh, androgens over into estrogen, right? So if you have an aromatase inhibitor, say someone like really uh, treatment resistant, you know, breast cancer, that's something to consider, right? If you're decreasing the amount of estrogen they're producing, you're basically making them menopausal essentially, right? Or postmenopausal. Um, glucocorticoids, right? We know these are going to have negative effects on the bone as well, right? Especially with long-term use. Think about your rheumatoid arthritis patients, right? Who are on, say, prednisone every single day. This is going to have a long-term effects on them. Uh, why do you think proton pump inhibitors could play a role here? Calcium absorption. What happens? Why is calcium absorption bad for the proton pump inhibitor? Mm -hmm. So pH when you're on a proton pump inhibitor, the stomach should do what? Go up because you're not producing acid, right? So calcium needs to be in an acidic medium in order to be able to solubilize and be absorbed very well. So you have a proton pump inhibitor on all the time because they have GERD, and all of a sudden they're not absorbing calcium very well, right? So then that PTH level is going to start to rise up, right, to deal with that low calcium. And then where is it going to get that calcium from? On the bones, right? So start to leach calcium from those bones. Those are things you want to think about, right? Um, anyway, so again, a lot of drugs maybe uh, you can say, hey, this is a possibility, but just keep in mind, keep uh, look at these uh, drugs and, and know the ones I highlighted for sure, but just keep in mind that other ones can be definitely playing a role here. Okay, so um, there's going to be this delicate balance, obviously, between laying down the bone and taking it back up. So you know, the osteoclasts need to be, or osteoclasts are normally doing what? They're breaking down the bone, osteoblasts are, they're laying down the bone, right? So again, I normally think blast, I think they'd be blowing it up, but not really. They're laying it down, right? Um, and so you need to have that delicate balance there, right? So normally estrogen is going to have, say, for instance, a, a strong effect on the osteoblast while maybe inhibiting the osteoclast. Parathyroid hormone is going to do what? It's going to stimulate the osteoclast to be more active, right? To actually uh, break up the, uh, that bone and get that calcium that's going to be leaching out of there. Um, as I mentioned, you know, testosterone and estrogen, all these are going to be playing a big role here, right? So, um, obviously, we talked about calcium being very important here. What's the other kind of component of that, though? Vitamin D, right? That's why oftentimes they're given together. Again, vitamin D has to be activated in two places. Where's that? The liver. That's going to get that first hydroxylation and then the, in the, in the kidneys, right? So, again, if you have bad kidneys, you may not be able to produce that, produce that vitamin D. That's that 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. That's the active form, right? So, again, when you're doing levels in your patients and coming back, 
need to be able to check for things like that, right? You know, and, and obviously one of the other things to kind of consider, I just kind of thought about this because I had a family member who was, um, they were showing me their labs basically, and they were like, oh, my, my ionized calcium was high, and they're doing PTH levels and, and vitamin D levels. They're doing all these different things, so I was trying to interpret it for them. Um, but one thing to note here as well is calcium is normally bound to what in the body? To albumin, right? So you have to consider older patients, what happens to their albumin levels? typically decrease, right? So again, you're dealing with elderly patients. They're, even though their normal serum calcium may look okay, you have to correct it based off the albumin, right? So one of the things you want to check for to actually see what the physiologically active calcium is, to check ionized calcium, right? You check an ionized calcium, that'll give you a better idea what's actually like the active form there, right? But again, also if you have kidney issues, like look at the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, that's going to tell you what the active form is if they have enough there, right? Because again, if either are down, the iCal or the vitamin D are down, what's going to happen? PTH levels are going to go up. They detect that, hey, we don't have enough around here. We're going to go ahead and start to increase PTH levels, right? So by supplementing, by giving more vitamin D, by giving more calcium, the parathyroid is going to be triggered and say, hey, okay, I have enough. I don't need to necessarily release anymore, right? So again, not only is it going to be affecting the GI tract, right? It's going to increase absorption of vitamin D and calcium, right? PTH does this. Uh, it's going to, we know, take up calcium from the bone, right? And then what else does it do in the kidneys? cause reabsorption of calcium, right? So calcium and phosphate both get reabsorbed there. So those are the important kind of considerations for what PTH is really doing here, okay? Um, and good, we've covered a lot of this stuff, so we're, we're very aware of this. And just know that estrogen deficiency, that's why you normally think of women uh, worrying about osteoporosis, but does that mean guys are, are exempt from it? Nope, gotta think about them too, right? Older gentlemen can also have those same fractures due to osteoporosis. Anyway, so our goal, we obviously want to stabilize whatever bone we have here and try to build it back up if we can and try to prevent any fractures. That's the biggest thing. Um, and then once the fractures do occur, try to make sure they're still being able to achieve some of their activity of daily living, make sure the quality of life is not too bad. Um, and then reducing, obviously, you know, a, a secondary effect of a fracture is pain, right? So again, they, they can all of a sudden become chronic pain patients, right? You see how these like elderly patients, like their medication list can balloon out like very easily just based off of you know, a few different disease states. You know, they're on two meds for their diabetes, two meds for their hypertension, they have a fall, they have a fracture, now they're on opioids, now they're on a bunch of uh, laxatives to try to deal with opioids. You know, a lot of these lists can get pretty big pretty easily, right? Anyway, so looking at non-farm therapy, um, you know, usually with calcium, um, as you mentioned, you know, calcium carbonate using Tums, what's, is it, isn't that kind of self-defeating? We talked about the pH issue being a problem there. But remember, antacids, they kind of burn themselves out pretty easily because when the stomach pH goes up, what does the stomach want to do to respond to that? Make more acid. Yeah. So again, you're going to find this is going to be a limited kind of issue there. But remember, calcium causes constipation. Older people typically get constipated, right? So it's one thing to consider, especially if they're on a calcium channel blocker. We know that's going to cause constipation, opioids, you know, all those things you have to think about. Um, it's also going to bind up to other stuff too. You know, if they're taking iron, because they have anemia, if they're on thyroid supplements, et cetera, those are things you want to think about. And then the vitamin D, think about what form you're going to be administering to them, right? Certainly you could stick all your old people out into the sun and say, all right, you're going to get all the vitamin D you need. But remember, they have to have the organ function to actually produce the active uh, form of vitamin D. More often than not, you're going to find that you know, we could give the, the one hydroxy vitamin D form. We just usually slip over to the other one. Do you remember the name for the activated form of vitamin D? Calcitriol. Remember calcitriol, we're going to talk about that was the activated form, the dihydroxy vitamin D. So if you had someone and say, hey, they have liver disease, uh, prenatal disease, and they need vitamin D, you're going to say, give them calcitriol, right? Calcifidiol is um, the, the one hydroxy vitamin D form, but we normally don't use that too frequently. But we'll talk about those forms in a second. So again, I'm sorry? No, so um, D2 and D3 are going to be these uh, inactive forms, ergo and the cholecalciferol. I believe choli is D3, ergo is, is D2, um, and those then get activated there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good question, though, right? Because you see on like a lot of foods and things like that, you know, it just contains vitamin D2, vitamin D3. Um, again, that's not the activated form, right? You have to give the actual calcitriol. And again, the downside of giving calcitriol is more expensive, right? Because again, they have to actually make the activated form. So it's a prescription only product versus stuff that you can get, you know, in your food, over the counter, all that, you know, as long as you have the organs to produce it, you're good to go. Right. Um, now, again, oftentimes medications will be needed to either try to treat or prevent osteoporosis. Now, the issue is that they're postmenopausal. What can you do? You get more estrogen, right? We'll talk about that. That will be a guidance section. It's called hormone replacement therapy. Are there any issues with hormone replacement therapy? 100%, right? We'll talk about those later, though. Um, but again, think about what the underlying etiology is. If you can correct that, that's obviously going to be beneficial, right? Um, and then we're going to see, uh, you know, if they 
oftentimes if they have kind of overt osteoporosis, certainly we'll treat that, but also we're looking at things like um, their DEXA scans and things like that to look at the risk for them developing a fracture within, say, for instance, a 10-year 10, uh, 10 period, right? So again, if the risk of, say, a hip fracture is 3% or higher than the next 10 years, that's usually a good candidate to try to make sure we're going to prevent that in the first place, right? 3% doesn't sound like very high, but, you know, I'd rather get down to 0% if I could, right? Um, and so those are things you're considering, right? And again, I'm not going to go into the DEXA scans and all of that, but I'll show you the different options we have to manage these patients here. Um, so we call these anti-resorptive therapies, right? So they're trying to inhibit the bone from being resorbed. We get the calcium out of the bone there, right? Um, so calcium, vitamin D, this is where we get into some of our newer drugs. We have the bisphosphonates. It's going to be our major category of anti-resorptive drugs that will be new here. We'll talk about estrogen agonist slash antagonist. Those are our SERMs. I've probably mentioned those very briefly during the cancer section, but we'll talk about those as well in the OB-GYN section there uh, additionally. Uh, calcitonin, uh, denosumab, estrogen, and then testosterone. Right? So these are all of our different anti-resorptive therapies. Now, the bisphosphonates, a couple of different varieties that are out there. So we have ilindronate, we have ibandronate, we have uh, resedronate, and then zoledronic acid. Zoledronic acid is the kind of the odd one out here. It's IV only. Um, it's kind of interesting, the, the dosing we'll talk about in just a few minutes here, but uh, actually it's only given once a year. So it's kind of nicer from a compliance standpoint, you just go in, get your dose, and you're done, right? Um, also, what's the problem with giving the drug, say, one time a year? It could be expensive. Or once it's in, it's in, right? You can't do anything about it, right? If it was a pill I had to take every single day, I had a bad reaction to it, I just stopped taking it inside of the system, right? Those are things you want to think about. Anyway, so what these agents are doing is they're mimicking this product called pyrophosphate. This is actually a natural product that we produce. It actually prevents bone resorption. So they inhibit the osteoclast activity and kind of stimulate the osteoblast activity, right? Um, again, their, their lifespan goes down, the, the number of them, their adhesion to the bone, all very good to inhibit this osteoclast and keep what bone is already there, there essentially. Now, these drugs have terrible bioavailability. The exception to that would be what? IV form, right? You know, if I give something IV, it has 100% bioavailability already, but very poor bioavailability. So it's very important that the administration um, be done correctly for these patients. So this is where education comes into play. You want to make sure they're taking it effectively. Um, so anything can really screw up you absorbing this. If you have extra food on the stomach, that's going to screw up absorption. You're going to have no bioavailability. If you're drinking soda with this, if you're drinking coffee with this, you know, grapefruit juice, it's going to screw it up, right? So basically what the patients have to do is they have to wake up, they have nothing on the stomach, they haven't drank anything, they can take this with a glass of water, and that's it. They have to stay upright. One of the things you're going to find with the bisphosphonates is they can cause an esophageal adhesion. There's actually been perforations that have caused before that. And then you're going to find a lot of GERD symptoms associated with this because they may feel that irritation. So that's why they recommend it only water, make sure it gets down the esophagus, and they stay upright. Because again, if they go back recumbent, it's just going to kind of sit there, or the chances are uh, better they're just going to sit there and cause irritation. Right? So those are the big things to consider. Other problems. Um, actually, it causes osteonecrosis of the jaw. So, again, it could be a very big deal. Actually, I had uh, one family member who was not able to take their bisphosphonate anymore because they actually found that they actually one of the roots of one of their teeth was actually starting to, to degrade away. So, it could have been an early sign of this osteonecrosis had they stayed on it and could have developed there. So, again, something to, uh, to think about um, if they're developing like jaw pain or anything like that. It's something you're going to monitor for and to know to look for that. So, as I mentioned, just take it with six ounces of water, no other liquids, no coffee, no juice, no nothing. I know most people can't function without their coffee in the morning, but tell them to hold off. Those, no other drugs they've taken recently, no food, no nothing. They need to be upright for 30 minutes, and then that's it. Okay, Wait 30 minutes, and then they can you know, go about their day. So, again, some of these are, that could be, you know, sound like kind of a negative thing from a compliance standpoint. Some of these are only given once a week. Some of these are giving you less than that. So, again, um, usually it's not going to be as, as big of a kind of impact on their daily um, schedule there. Um, some of them are monthly, some of them are yearly. As I mentioned, zoledronic acid, just one time a year, which is great. Uh, other options we would have. We did not, uh, could not use uh, a bisphosphonate with something called denosumab. Obviously, you know, it's a monoclonal antibody just based off the name there. Um, basically, it binds to this rankle protein. And so essentially what that does um, is it works on these osteoclast precursor cells. So if you cannot develop the mature osteoclast, you can't sit there and resorb the bone, right? Uh, so that's ideally what it's going to be doing there. Um, Sub-Q injection, because you know it's a protein, so oral uh, absorption is not going to work there. And then it has about a 25-day half-life. So it's a good long duration of action, and you dose it every six months or so. Um, so again, good for patients who um, cannot receive a bisphosphonate, could be another option for them. Obviously, it's going to be more expensive. Obviously, it's going to um, carry some risk for you know anaphylactoid, anaphylactic reactions because it is a protein. Uh, so just be aware of that. Um, 
And some people, there's a concern about this bone turnover suppression. Because um, again, if you're inhibiting the osteoclast, and, and normally your bones, um, you know, are your bones static and they never change? No, there's always going to be this process of pulling up the bone and laying down new bone, and pulling up the bone and laying down new bone. By inhibiting that process, because the osteoclasts are done, um, there could be some concern that maybe the structural integrity of the bone is not quite as good as it one, uh, could have been. Um, but again, it's better than it being you know, basically moth-eaten and, and that for fracture, right? So it's kind of one of those um, double-edged swords kind of thing. Um, other things we could uh, potentially use, we have calcitonin. Um, this is not normally recommended for osteoporosis, but anyone know what calcitonin is? What it normally does? It decreases calcium with the... It's kind of the opposite side of PTH, right? So it's going to be the thing that's going to be, um, you know, seeing when calcium is elevated, you need to get calcium levels back down. This is where calcitonin is going to come into play. And we actually produce calcitonin ourselves, right? Um, but you may find this could be good for patients who maybe are not able to receive the other therapies. Um, this is actually administered um, intranasally. So you can find like an intranasal spray they can use for this. Um, and so they found kind of inconsistent results. You know, it works for some fractures, but they don't have evidence of it working for other fractures. Kind of the thing where they just don't have the studies to show that. Um, more often than not, you're going to find that patients with hypercalcemia, so like Paget's disease or something, may actually end up um, getting calcitonin. Some people have this kind of on as-needed sort of basis at home. Um, sometimes I have to come into the ER and they'll end up perceiving it. So it just depends on, on the patient there. Um, Anyway, so again, that's just another option, probably more like a third line sort of agent there for osteoporosis. Yes, How come it isn't used um, more frequently just because it is? Like, it doesn't have as, because um, again, if you think about it, like this is opposing the actions of PTH, but it doesn't really deal with the actual, the bone effects itself, right? So um, doesn't really treat the underlying cause. It's just trying to, you know, it's kind of like a Band-Aid almost, right? And so maybe it could be as effective. We just don't have the studies that show that, but certainly for the, the bisphosphonates, we have good studies to show, yeah, it inhibits, you know, or prevents, you know, vertebral fractures, femur fracture, you know, et cetera. Um, so because of that, um, we like those as our first line agents here. So just less effective, you know, overall. Anyway, uh, there's another one called teriparatide or Forteo. Um, this is typically if they fail other therapies and they're really high risk for fractures, they could also use this as well. This actually has a similar amino acid sequence, basically the first 34 amino acids of, of PTH has similar activity. So the idea here is that what it's going to be doing um, is actually will uh, work more as like an anabolic agent. And when I say anabolic, what does that mean? It's building things up, right? Catabolic means it's going to be breaking things down. So like glucocorticoids are catabolic, androgens and estrogens typically are anabolic, right? Insulin is an anabolic hormone, right? Um, but basically what this is doing is it's going to be working as this kind of anabolic agent to try to stimulate that bone formation. So usually the osteoblast number is going to go up, um, but there's actually a cancer risk associated with this. So it's why it's not used frequently uh, and why it actually has a REMS program associated with it. They tell you, tell you to take it less than two years. You guys remember the REMS programs we talked about? Right, like Accutane, like they're, they're special programs to make sure you're mitigating some of these risks here. So especially this bone cancer. Because again, what is cancer? Cells rapidly dividing, just kind of doing their own thing. Like this is kind of stimulating that process, right? So that's why uh, they have to be really careful with that. Okay, so again, you can kind of review this, but normally it's a stepwise sort of approach here. Obviously, the first thing you want to do when you have a patient who may be at risk for osteoporosis is what? Dietary supplementation, so calcium, vitamin D, right? So you want to fix that issue first. Yeah. Start, start with the easy stuff first, right? Um, what can you do from there? Sure, yep, so exercise can be good. What else? So we get into the drugs now, right? So again, bisphosphonates are going to be our first line therapy, right? Those patients don't want to take drugs. And, and, We'll figure it out. But um, yeah, so start with the non-farm stuff first, obviously, right? So weight bearing exercise, right? You know, those little micro fractures are all really good for helping to kind of build up the bone and be stronger. Um, calcium and vitamin D supplementation if they need it. But be aware of those side effects, same with like calcium, like constipation, et cetera, right? Um, and then that's when we move on to things like the bisphosphonate. So you're going to be your first line therapy. If that's not working, that's where you can consider things like um, uh, the denosumab. That's where you can consider things like the calcitonin. And then obviously teriparatide is going to be kind of your last line agent there, right? And it's all based on the risk factor. And I'm not going to ask you specifically, hey, the patient has this risk for this type of fracture 10 years from now. What do they need to be on? But if I ask you and I say, hey, the patient you know, is on ibandronate and they got this terrible you know, GERD symptoms and they just can't take it and they just end up throwing it up. Um, or they start to develop, say, for instance, you know, evidence of osteonecrosis. What do you want to move them to? You know what a second line agent would be, right? You know it's not teriparatide, you know, probably not calcitonin. Maybe that denosumab is a good agent for them, right? So, again, know the stepwise sort of approach we're going to take with that, right? But always first, calcium, vitamin D supplementation. But if I ask you, hey, you know, patient is on uh, or has, you know, chronic kidney disease, what vitamin D supplement do you want to start them on? 
Calcitriol, right? Calcitriol is going to be the thing with that, right? I know it's hard because get, you get mixed up with calcitonin and calcifidiol and calcitriol and all that kind of good stuff. But keep in mind the difference, right? Calcitonin is going to be the PTH antagonist, right? You're blocking the effects of that essentially. Just like you have, um, I'm trying to think, what are some good examples? You have like growth hormone, you have growth hormone inhibiting hormone like somatostatin, right? So again, those are opposed to one another. This is the same thing as that. Um, calcifidiol is that. that the first activated form of vitamin D, but not the fully activated form. What's the activated form? Calcitriol. Calcitriol, right. Some people say calcitriol. I say calcitriol, it doesn't matter. Hmm? I say calcitriol. Calcitriol, I don't know, that sounds kind of good to me. I don't know, I just say calcitriol. It just kind of rolls off my tongue a little better. Half of one, or uh, six of one and half a dozen of another, right? Let's say. Anyway, uh, moving the last thing that we'll talk about here is going to be gout. What is gout? The so uric acid levels are up, and then what happens? They deposit. Where do they go to? The joints, right? What's the big uh, thing you always think about? The big toe, the great toe. I think it's an okay toe, but some people call it the great toe. But um, right, so this uric acid, what happens when it deposits there? Inflammation, right? But the big thing is it's going out of solution, right? So it's crystallizing out, the thing precipitating, and that's what's causing a lot of the pain, right? You're going to see a lot of neutrophils and everything trying to go to that area of inflammation. It's going to be very painful. Um, I always love those like old pictures of um, like from like old like colonial times. Like, these pictures of people with gout and they have these little devils with like pitchforks that are like poking their big toe. I always thought those were kind of funny, but um, yeah, very very painful. And let's look at some ways we can deal with that. So. Um, but basically, like, hyperuricemia is really the, the ultimate problem here, right? So, again, where do we get a lot of uric acid from in our diets? Meats. Yep. All the good stuff, right? A lot of red meats and stuff is one of the big things. But, yeah, so those when as we get the hyperuricemia, and say, for instance, we're dehydrated or say the pH is going to be uh, somewhat favorable for the formation of these crystals, they form out in the joint, right? The great toe is certainly effective, but other joints can be affected as well, right? Very painful, so we're going to look at some ways to deal with that. Um, but, yeah, you could even see uric acid, nephrolithiasis, right? Those crystals could crystallize out there, so these are all concerns as well. But... Um, there's a few different ways that this can occur, right? So it could be due to either we have overproduction of uric acid, right? So it could be because we have some kind of enzyme abnormality that's causing this to occur. It could be we're having increased breakdown of nucleic acids. So there's actually something called tumor lysis syndrome you have to consider with cancer patients, which is like leukemia. If you go through and, and cause all these cells to die off, they're going to lyse out all this DNA, all those nucleotides can be broken down into uric acid. You can find that this hyperuricemic crisis. I'll talk about a specific drug we use for that. Um, you know, excessive cell turnover, those are all things to consider. Um, and then you could also have this under excretion from the kidneys, right? It could so either be due to dehydration or it could be idiopathic, right? So again, we're going to find there's ways we can either deal with the overproduction side of things or ways we can deal with the, uh, the elimination side of things, as we'll see. So obviously, uh, our goal here is to one, if they have an acute attack, treat that. And then we're also going to look at ways we can try to prevent kind of recurrent symptoms from occurring there, right? So just like we talked about with, say, for instance, um, you know, asthma, we talked about things, you know, good controller medications to prevent an asthma attack. And then we have things to treat the acute asthma attack. Same thing here. There's medicines for acute gouty attacks and things to try to prevent them from occurring, right? Um, so we'll look at some uh, anti-inflammatories and then we're going to look at a urate lowering therapy there. Okay. Anyone know what drug is, falls in that urate lowering therapy? Allopurinol, yeah, that's going to be the main one we're going to talk about there. <clears throat> so again, looking at non-pharma, obviously, you know, some ice can be pretty good um, to help kind of deal with some of that, that uh, pain associated with that. It may not always be effective, but we can use things like NSAIDs, right? We know a lot about NSAIDs. We can use things like corticosteroids potentially, right? So they may get some prednisone or something to try to deal with that inflammation. Usually short courses, right? More of the pulse dose kind of therapy there, you know, three to five days or so. Um, the colchicine will be a new one we'll talk about. Uh, we haven't talked about before. Anyone know what colchicine does? It inhibits microtubules, actually. So we'll talk about that, how that works in a few seconds here. Um, uh, but yeah, so again, start the therapy early, you know, within 24 hours or so. The earlier you can start it, the better. And a lot of times you'll have patients who, you know, they have recurrent gouty attacks. You're going to give them a prescription on an as-needed basis. Say, hey, if you know you're going to have an attack coming on, like start taking the culture scene now, right? So again, the earlier they can take it, the better off they're going to be. Um, and again, using combination therapy, usually going to be limited to when they have maybe multiple joints being affected or the pain is uh, not being managed with just one of them alone. So as I mentioned, um, you know, NSAIDs, you can go back and look at the pain management slides. We know a lot about those already. But the corticosteroids typically are going to be just as e efficacious. However, they can be, you know, ridden with a lot more side effects than the NSAIDs. We know what those are already. Um, occasionally, you may actually get an intraarticular injection 
you may use this every once in a while. So where you use something like triamcinolone can be used uh, occasionally, just like you'd use for like osteoarthritis or something like that. But this is used more in the acute phase. Um, and just be aware, you know, if they're on corticosteroids for more than a week, they need to taper, right? Otherwise, what do you have happen? Adrenal insufficiency, right? Blood pressure is going to go out of control. Their glucose is going to go out of control. All those kind of things, right? Now, colchicine, as we mentioned, is a new one. This is an anti-mitotic drug. If you remember back when we talked about cancer, we talked about our vinca alkaloids, and we talked about, what else? The taxanes, right? They were working on the microtubules. Colchicine also works on the microtubules in a little bit different way. If you look at those slides, you'll see there's there's a different um, spots where they're working. Colchicine was on one of those slides. Um, ba basically, it's trying to help to prevent this rapidly, you know, these cells from rapidly dividing. The inflammatory cells are what they're going to be focusing on, uh, namely things like the neutrophils are attracted to those sites of gout. Um, so fairly effective. It's a very old drug. We've been using it for, for many, many years now. Um, However, they do find that you want to start early in therapy. If it's more than 36 hours, typically it starts to lose efficacy there. And there's a lot of dose-dependent nausea and vomiting associated with this. Because again, if you think back to your cancer drugs, what was the main side effect of cancer drugs? Nausea and vomiting, right? So same thing's happening here when you're uh, starting to, to affect these cells. And actually one of the most um, potentially deadly overdoses uh, that someone can have is actually with colchicine. Or one of the things we really couldn't do a whole lot about it, right? You know, if someone overdoses on opioids, I can treat that no problem. Uh, colchicine, you can't really do a whole lot with it, right? It's all supportive management. But uh, so it could be potentially dangerous if not used appropriately. In fact, what was interesting is the old dosing guideline for colchicine used to be you would continue taking it until you threw up. And then once you threw up, you knew you'd had enough, right? It's not usually the kind of instructions you want to write. Like, you keep taking this until you throw up, and then you're done. I don't want to throw up. Like, it sounds terrible. Um, other things can happen, like neutropenia. That makes sense, right? Your uh, white cells are rapidly dividing. This is going to affect the my mitosis of those cells. Um, you can develop neuromyopathies as well, right? So things to consider. This is going to be more as an as needed, not taken every single day. Some patients might do that. I've seen a couple of cases where that's occurred. Um, but for the most part, it's going to be on just for the acute attacks. Okay. So again, looking at the pain intensity, obviously things like opioids could be used potentially, but we like to use the other options first, right? NSAIDs, corticosteroids, all these are going to be recommended um, first. If it's more mild to moderate, you know, NSAIDs, colchicine can be good, but for the more severe ones is where the combination therapy or the corticosteroids are going to be coming into role here, right? Um, and then we're going to talk about using the urate-lowering lower, uh, urate lowering therapies in just a few minutes. Okay, so again, um, as far as the hyperuricemia and gout, so how can we get the actual uric acid levels down. Well, one, we'd like to do things like limit alcohol intake. That tends to increase uric acid levels, you know. Um, medications that can do this, so things like niacin, low-dose aspirin, thiazides, um, they can all either lead to dehydration, which can concentrate the uric acid, um, or can decrease the actual excretion of the uric acid itself, right? And obviously, you know, avoid, you know, diets rich in, you know, red meats and things like that, because again, all those purines are going to get broken down into eventually uric acid, right? So, um, as far as farm therapy goes, the urate lowering therapy, uh, allopurinol is going, probably going to be the cornerstone of this. Uh, we do find it to be pretty effective for patients who may have like two or more attacks a year. Uh, they tend to do better with, with having some of this urate lowering therapy on board, right? Um, or especially if they have any kind of history like urolithiasis or they have like chronic kidney disease, they also tend to be uh, benefiting from this as well. Because again, the kidneys are bad, they're not going to be able to excrete that uric acid very well there, right? And so two ways we can do this. Um, we have... Um, we have xanthine oxidase inhibitors. These are going to deal with the actual production of uric acid. And then we're going to have what we call uricosurics. That just means you're going to pee out the uric acid, right? So you're going to be able to eliminate it faster from the kidneys. So um, this pathway here, I just want you to memorize is basically the whole thing. Um, if you could draw it on the test, that would be no, I'm just kidding. Um, it gets complicated, right? So basically what I really want you to focus on is that eventually you see here Darren, at the bottom is uric acid, right? There's a few steps before that where you have hypoxanthine and xanthine. Um, there's an enzyme here called xanthine oxidase. This is what's basically kind of doing the last stages of this conversions from, you know, things like the you know, amino acids coming out of your meat into eventually coming into uric acid, right? By inhibiting this enzyme here, by inhibiting xanthine oxidase, you inhibit the actual production of uric acid. So when you think allopurinol, you want to think xanthine oxidase inhibitor. That's what's causing you to have less uric acid being produced. Okay? Make sense? That's all I really need to know for that. But again, it gets very very uh, complicated here. This, you just want to focus on the tail end step here. And so looking at that, um, as I mentioned, they're inhibiting that process of converting hypoxanthine eventually into uric acid. Very widely used. It's probably the number one thing used to prevent gouty attacks. We have allopurinol, which is xyloprim. Um, note here the side effects. 
Um, you do want to worry about skin manifestations, things like toxic epidermal necrolysis could occur, Stevens Johnson's could occur. So you do want to be careful with that, right? Let them know if you notice any severe rashes developing, you need to stop taking it immediately, et cetera. Um, just be aware of that. But otherwise, pretty well tolerated. And then we have an, another one called Flabuxostat. This is actually a, a newer one that we have. And again, a little bit better tolerated. Not as much GI upset associated with it. You may see some transaminitis. You may want to monitor the renal or uh, hepatic function for those patients. And then as far as the uricosuric drugs we have here, um, we have basically Prevenicid. And Prevenicid is one of those um, very old drugs. We used to use it a lot to actually prevent the elimination of, of penicillin. We used to use it back in the day because penicillin, when it was kind of the only antibiotic we had, we didn't want the patient to get rid of it and pee it out because otherwise they wouldn't be able to treat the infection very well. It's hard to come by to get penicillin. So they'd actually get Prevenicid to prevent the excretion of it. And that way the patient would hold on to more penicillin for longer, treat that infection, and you got a little bit better um, bang for your buck, essentially. But um, So it causes a ton of different drug interactions based off the fact that it'll uh, affect the excretion of many different drugs. So we don't use it too, too frequently, um, but it could be useful if maybe they couldn't receive allopurinol, maybe they had a bad skin manifestation, they couldn't get that. This may be an option uh, for those patients there. Now, again, if you think about it, you're peeing out more uric acid. There's more uric acid out there in the renal tubules you could be at risk for. Actually, your lithiasis, right? You know, those those um, uh, your gastric crystals starting to form out in the actual kidneys. So you do want to be careful of that. But that makes sense based off the mechanism of the drug. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, you could see increased levels of other drugs like penicillin, cephalosporins, et cetera. And, but if they have renal impairment, do not want to use this for them. Okay. So again, if I had a patient who needed, um, you know, preventative therapy for gout and I said they have renal dysfunction, you'd say go out of here and I'll probably or for bucks a stat. Okay, and then kind of one last drug, you probably won't ever have to use this in your career, I hope not at least, right? Uh, but if you work with like Hemonc or something like that, you may have to use it occasionally, but this is called Raspiracase or Elatec. This is actually uh, a recombinant form of urate oxidase. This is actually the enzyme that breaks down uric acid into more water-soluble form. And so this is mainly used in patients who have like um, tumor lysis syndrome, right? So if you had someone who had leukemia, they got their first round of chemotherapy and uric acid levels are skyrocketing, um, they're at risk for that nephrolithiasis, et cetera, we can actually give this to them and that will uh, directly break down that uric acid and, and they can just pee it right out, right? Those water-soluble uh, byproducts. Uh, very, very expensive though. I can't remember the last time, but it was, you know, within tens of thousands of dollars uh, when they needed it. So when they need it, we have to get like special approval. We have to basically it's like an act of Congress almost to get it. Um, you know, so for instance, you know, we'll we'll have a doc who wants to order it, right? So we have like the Hemont doc that orders it. We'd have to call my I'd have to call my boss, director of farm, say, hey, the doc wants to use this, and you have criteria and say, hey, do you meet this criteria, right? So again, zero acid level, X, Y, and Z. Did they receive this at X, Y, and Z? And so then um, you know, then they'll say, okay, well, it looks like it could be good. And then we have to call the director uh, or the head of pediatrics, essentially. So the person basically under the president of the hospital will basically call them, who's a physician, and say, hey, can we use this drug? It's like $30,000 or whatever it is. Uh, and they say, ooh, okay, I guess so. And then we get it. But it takes a lot of phone calls, right? So, um, and again, sometimes you as a provider, you're not privy to all the stuff that goes on in the background. So just be aware that sometimes when things seem like they're taking forever, usually it's because we're probably having to like do something like that and try to get special approval for these crazy drugs you're ordering, right? But again, most of the time you're probably not going to have to order it. Um, you guys ever heard of G6PD deficiency? Yeah. I don't really have time to talk about it too in depth here. Um, you guys are just so familiar with it already? You guys are experts? Yeah. Wow, fantastic. I'm very happy with that. that. This can actually cause... Um, this can be bad in patients with G6PD deficiency. You want to be careful. That. What, what's the story behind that? Why you guys... You just... Act like, yeah, I had an Oh, very good. Okay. Um, yeah, so just be aware. Patients with G6PD deficiency, this can actually cause hemolysis and hemoglobinemia. So there's one thing to know with that. Okay. Um, so again, looking at this, uh, you can go through this, but basically they start off dietary modifications, right? Get that under control, get the alcohol under control, the protein, all of that. Um, and then looking at your uh, urate lowering therapy, xanthine oxidase inhibitors are going to be recommended as the first line, right? So again, your allopurinols for buxostat is going to be uh, kind of the first thing to start with. As an alternative, you could use prevenicid, but beware the, the caveats with that, right? The nephrolithiasis, uh, not good for renal patients, et cetera, right? Um, and then you know, you're going to have your anti-inflammatory therapy. Some people will be on, say, low-dose colchicine every single day. It's not done super commonly. More often than not, I see it on an as-needed basis for an acute gouty attack. Okay. Uh, so again, just things to consider. Um, yeah, just go that stepwise approach. See if one thing's not working, then you move on to the next thing, essentially, right? Okay. So any questions on that? Let's do a quick 10-minute break. When we come back, we're going to blitz through some behavioral stuff. Ready or not, I'm getting started. Any questions? Nope. So we're talking about major depressive disorder. 
I'm sure many of you know the causes for this, including taking intro to farm and farm one, also PTSD, generalized anxiety disorder, possibly uh, dissociative personality disorder, uh, all, all sorts of things, right? I run the gamut. Anyway, um, again, have you covered already uh, any behavioral med stuff as far as depression, anything like that? Okay, so you guys, I'm going to give you um, just the real brief survey, just so I can get into the drugs and try to get through that, because that's going to be our purpose here. Now, um, one of the big things to note, anxiety and depression, they go hand in hand. They are absolute best bed buddies. Um, you need to make sure you're addressing both of those in your patients, right? And again, some people are going to be more predominantly anxiety, some people are more predominantly depression. But again, usually they're going to be some component together, right? And so you need to consider both of those when you're dealing with these patients. Now, again, we've had pharmacotherapy for a good long time for this, since like the 50s. And nowadays, our medications are getting better. They're more specific. They tend to lack a lot of the side effects of old ones. We'll talk about some of the old ones, just so you kind of know what to look for. Because some patients just don't manage on them, but it's not as common as you see nowadays. But we'll talk about them just to get some historical perspective. Um, but one of the big things to know with uh, depression therapy is you guys are familiar with the placebo effect, right? What is that? Yeah, you're not taking anything, but your symptoms improve, right? What, what What's causing those improvements? Yeah. Right, so again, it's, it's uh, my wife used to get so mad at me because I always talk about positive mental attitude, and I always say, you just need a little PMA in your life, and you'd feel so much better. And she's like, I'm going to shove that PMA somewhere where the sun don't shine. Um, so, yeah, sometimes when you feel like you're doing something for yourself, like you get that boost of like, okay, well, yeah, I'm doing something, I'm taking control of my disease today, I'm doing, that's placebo effect, right? So when you do studies, you actually find that some people, even though they're getting placebo in a trial and they don't know it, they actually have improvements in their depression symptoms, right? So again, we know that there's some placebo effect here, and so it makes it very difficult to tell how effective are our medications, right? And again, you're going to find that there's no golden bullet, silver bullet to say, like, this is the absolute best antidepressant versus this one. Based of it, most of it is you're based off of uh, side effects, like what is tolerable to that patient, et cetera, right? Um, the other thing to consider as well is that anyone know how long it takes for antidepressants to really kick in and work? Four to six weeks, right, to really get full effects here. So that means you're going to start taking the antidepressants, and you're like, okay, well, I don't feel any better. I got all these side effects. What's going to happen? Um, they're going to stop taking it, right? So compliance is a big deal. You need to educate effectively to make sure they're going to be taking it. Because the side effects show up how long? Or when do they start showing up? Almost immediately, right? But the therapeutic effects take that long. Like, that sounds like a bomb deal to me, right? So um, again, educate them. Let them know they need to keep with it in order to do that, right? Um, there's this other thing you're going to find, uh, a black box warning associated with any of the antidepressant classes here. Anyone know what that is? Increased risk of suicidality. Anyone know why that is? They're, um, I used to know this. You're going to know it again right now. Um, it seems, it sounds counterintuitive, right? I'm going to give you a drug and you're going to increase suicidality. Like that doesn't make sense, but here's what happens, right? Okay. Go ahead. That you start to get more motivated before you're actually feeling better. So now you're more motivated to even kill yourself. That is exactly it, right? So, um, so one of the things you're going to find, very good, very good. Um, is that these patients have no energy a lot of times to act on the suicidal thoughts they may have had, right? So again, like, oh, I killed myself. What's the point? I'm just going to lay here and, you know, I don't know, watch Netflix for the whole day, whatever, right? Whatever the case may be, whatever your, the, their symptoms are, they, they do. Um, so one of the things you're going to find is that when you start them off on these uh, antidepressants, they typically get more energy, right? This thing called akathisia that we have. Anyone familiar with the term akathisia? We'll talk about it in the um, schizophrenic meds a little bit later on, the antipsychotics. Um, it's this term, you guys ever, like, um, you ever like been on a plane for too long and like you uh, you pull into the gate and you're ready to get off that plane but like everyone's just moving so slow and you're just sitting there just like Ooh, you got ants in your pants that's what akathisia is right you got this energy ready to jump out of your skin but you can't do anything about it they get that energy right so they get the energy and then they can actually act on those suicidal thoughts without necessarily having their depression being treated in the first place so that's how i kind of think about it right so be aware that any of these patients can have increased risk for suicidality especially in children we see this more in adolescents and children and again that's a population we're starting to treat more frequently because we recognize depression starts early for some of these patients. Um, so be aware that you need to educate on that. Be like, hey, do you know, you know, especially with parents and other caregivers, hey, are you noticing any differences in their mood? Like, you know, you're noticing they're being more, you know, kind of withdrawn or any of these things that could be warning signs that they are, you know, uh, could be a risk for, for harming themselves. Okay. So just that's kind of the general caveat I'm going to uh, point out with this. Anyway, there's lots of other causes for uh, depression you need, need to consider. A lot of antidepressants, I'm sorry, not antihypertensives uh, anti are going to cause depression-like symptoms. Propranol is a big one. Calcium channel blockers, potentially. Um, isotretinoin, right? What do we use that for? Yeah. 
Accutane, right? So again, maybe you're depressed about your acne, but then you start taking isotretinoin, and all of a sudden, you feel even worse, right? Could be bad. Uh, anticonvulsants are a big one that can do that. Hormonal therapy, right? So again, all these things could be potentially causing the symptoms of anxiety and depression, but are related to the medications there. Okay, so other things to consider. Um, always look at the medication risk to see kind of what's going on that could be playing a role, right? Anyway, uh, looking at anxiety, there's a lot of different conditions that fall underneath this, right? So again, you have things like generalized anxiety disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder. You guys will all be having that by the time you graduate, um, you know, things like that. And we'll talk about how these symptoms can be treated a little differently, you know? So for instance, the acute panic attack is treated a little differently than you would see just typical depression or typical, you know, kind of baseline anxiety. And we'll look at some different options for that, right? Also talk about things like performance anxiety, right? So again, if I were to ask one of you to come up and give the rest of this lecture, you'd probably be pretty anxious, right? So we have medications we can use for that as well, okay? Anyway, so why do people get depressed? You can say the news, you can say, no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, physiochemically, why do people get depressed? Decrease serotonin level. Decrease serotonin level. Actually, we don't know. We have no idea, right? We do know that we think some of these neurotransmitters are playing a role, things like serotonin. There used to be an old school antihypertensive drug that actually depleted a lot of your catecholamines like norepinephrine and serotonin. And guess what a big side effect of that drug was? They become depressed. So we kind of thought that that was the reason for it for a while. Um, but the drugs that we give, they immediately increase serotonin levels, but they don't immediately treat the symptoms of depression. So there's some disconnect there, right? So even though we're increasing those levels, something else is going on, right? There's probably some downstream effects we're not really cognizant of yet that are happening on the background um, to make your patients less depressed, right? Um, so it's one of those things where even though we know how the drugs are working, we know how the side effects are happening, we don't really know why it's treating the depression necessarily, okay? So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind, especially when patients are like, why does this drug work? And you can say confidently, I don't know, right? Um, so anyway, so what are our goals here? We'd like to reduce the symptoms of acute depression, right? We like to facilitate their return back to normal function so they can get a job or they can get out of the house, they can do whatever they like to do. Uh, and then hopefully prevent any kind of like recurrent episodes of that depression there. That's our goals here. And so there's a few different phases here. You can deal with like kind of the acute phase where you're actually getting these uh, remission of symptoms initially. Uh, and then there's more of a continuation sort of maintenance sort of phase there. Now, are some patients gonna be on this lifelong? 100% right. Some people, they may grow out of it. Some people may not. It just depends on the patient there. Um, and again, the other thing to note here as well, what can we do as far as like non-farm therapy goes? Uh, Cognitive behavioral therapy, right? That's going to be huge, right? We have big synergism when you're using these two together. Now, again, you can find some people are like, well, there's no point in taking drugs. I don't like those. And they just go to therapy. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, there's some people that just want to take drugs. and they're like, oh, I don't want to talk to somebody. I don't want to talk about my feelings. That's terrible. And they don't do that. But if you can get the two together, that's great, right? What other things could you do from a non-farm therapy? Hmm? Okay, so it could be some herbal supplement. We'll talk about one particular one a little bit later on. You know, what's the, the thing to consider with herbal supplements? Uh, drug, interactions. drug interactions. Are they telling you that they're taking this herbal supplement? I don't know, right? If you ask the question, what medications do you take? They say, oh, I don't take any medications. Yes, do you take any herbal supplements? Do you take any dietary supplements? That answer may be very different, right? So you want to ask the questions. Um, where else was it going? Oh, yeah, even things like electroconvulsive therapy, right? No, it's shocking we still use that, but... Anyway, I just like that joke. There's even um, one thing that uh, is used occasionally called repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, where they actually uh, put a probe on the on the forehead and actually will kind of beam these magnetic waves into your brain. They've actually found some good effects on bipolar disorder and depression. I don't know, but there's different stuff that's out there, right? So again, drugs are not always the answer for your patients, but they can be a very useful tool in your toolbox, right? Especially when you're combining with other things. They tend, tend to see synergism there. But what we're going to focus on now, obviously, going to be the drugs, okay? Um, so antidepressants, we're going to find a lot of people that respond well, even if you were just giving them sugar pills, right? Uh, mainly because of that placebo effect there. But the reason why we're going to choose one drug versus another is typically going to be one, um, you know, what's their side effect profile looking like? You know, um, a lot of these antidepressants, anyone know what a common sort of problematic side effect is for most of these? Sexual dysfunction, a lot of them cause sexual dysfunction, right? So again, if you're in a, you know, in a relationship and then you're depressed and then you start taking medication, now you can't have sex with your partner anymore. That's not good, right? You may be feeling more depressed, right? Now you have, now you have marital disputes with your, your partner, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, so those are things to consider, right? Looking at drug-drug interactions, looking at what they've responded to in the past, right? Sometimes just because you don't respond well to one drug in the class doesn't mean you won't respond well to other drugs within that class. There's a lot of differences in your individuals. Again, as I say, your patients are all snowflakes. It's not derogatory. It's just saying that they all respond a little bit differently, right? 
Okay. And so a lot of times the antidepressants are either going to be classified based off their chemical structure or it's going to be based off of their actual mechanism of action. Okay. So again, be able to kind of delineate between those two and I'll, I'll talk about what those are in just a few minutes here. Okay. Um, knowing the mechanism doesn't necessarily help us with the therapeutic effect, but it tells us a lot of what the side effects are going to be as well. We'll look at that in a second. So as I mentioned, two to six weeks before you really get kind of full effects out of these, you need to let them know, hey, stick with it. Even though the side effects are there, stick with it for at least six weeks, see how it's going to work for you. If not, consider changing your dose, changing the drug completely, right? Uh, but a lot of people are going to fail therapy um, uh, with these drugs mainly due to side effects and just feeling like the drug's not working, right? And again, if you were to ask a depressed patient to come into your office and you say, hey, are you taking your pills like you're supposed to? And they're going to say, of course I am. Yeah, of course. And they're like, nah, I don't know. I don't want to. They're never going to tell you that, right? Or a lot of patients may not tell you that. So just be aware. It's kind of intelligent noncompliance. Where they're not going to be really forthright with that information. Okay. Um, and so anyway, what we're going to find is that with a lot of the newer agents, they tend to have a lot better side effect profile. Their therapeutic index is much better than a lot of the older agents, right? So when we talk about things like monoamine oxidase inhibitors and we talk about tricyclic antidepressants, those in overdose potentially very, very deadly, right? SSRIs, newer class of drugs, not very deadly. I've seen patients overdose on thousands and thousands of milligrams of sertraline, not have a problem. I've seen kids getting a one tablet of Elevil or amitriptyline and be potentially deadly, right? So again, the therapeutic index between these are huge as we're gonna see, uh, and again, um, the drugs are much safer nowadays, which is great because if they have the increased risk of suicidality and they take all their Zoloft, they're much better off than they were to do that say 30 years ago and take all of their you know, amitriptyline or their Nardil or whatever the case may be. We'll, we'll get into the drugs in a second here. So anyway, um, so the major categories we have here, again, these are the older ones at the top, moving down to the newer ones at the bottom, usually have less side effects. They're more selective in their actions here. But the ones we see at the top are going to be our monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Does anyone know what this is going to do for us? So monoamine oxidase usually means it's going to be oxidizing monoamines. That mainly includes norepinephrine and serotonin, right? What's the abbreviation for serotonin? 5-HT. So when you see 5-HT, you just know the serotonin, right? So NE is just going to be norepinephrine here. So it's going to help prevent the breakdown of serotonin and norepinephrine, okay? After that, after we had the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, and then we had our tricyclic antidepressants. And again, that name is based off the chemical structures. If you look up any of them, you'll see three ring structures on them. They're going to be inhibiting the reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine. Now, what does that mean when I say re inhibit the uptake? Right, so if you were to imagine, if I were to draw this out, and you look at the, the synapse, right? Here's our presynaptic neuron. Here's our postsynaptic neuron. Again, they look like mushrooms or something, but that's, that's what we're talking about here, right? And again, imagine you have your little vesicles full of serotonin. Normally, they get released out into the vesicle, and then they have these transporters here that they will then get recycled into, right? Okay? So if I block this recycling, what happens? I have more serotonin, more norepinephrine in that synapse. And that's what we thought for a while was what actually treated the depression. You have more serotonin, you got to feel better, right? Probably not. There's probably some downstream stuff that happens here in this postsynaptic neuron. Who knows? We don't. But at least that's what we're, uh, the, how the drugs are working. And that's how a lot of the side effects are going to be happening here, right? So that's what we're going to be focusing on. So that's where your uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors are, then come about. Selective in that they only affect serotonin reuptake, right? And then you then have the SNRIs, which are the selective serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors called them SNRIs. Okay, so it looks like serotonin and norepinephrine. These are still more selective than something like the TCAs are. And I'll talk about some of the other mechanisms that TCAs have, right? TCAs are very nasty from a drug, uh, from a side effect sort of standpoint. So anyway, so again, this picture is kind of showing you what I uh, tried to crudely draw just a second ago. But again, imagine here you have norepinephrine. This is a noradrenergic neuron. And it releases norepinephrine. Normally it's going to be releasing norepi here into the synapse. And you have this reuptake, right? Now, notice as well, remember we talked about alpha-2 receptors? What drugs interact with alpha-2? Clonidine. Clonidine did, right? So clonidine did what? It acted at alpha-2 receptors, and that did what? It decreased blood pressure and heart rate by doing what? Because it's one of these autoreceptors. By inhibiting or by activating this, you actually inhibit the release of norepinephrine. You also find some alpha-2 receptors here that do the same thing. So what do you think could be a potential side effect of giving clonidine? Depression, right? So again, these are other antihypertensives that can also cause symptoms of depression, right? Based off there, what they're doing to your norepinephrine and serotonin. Don't you hear about these dogs with anxiety, like one of I've never heard of a dog receiving clonidine. Or is it clonopin? Probably clonopin. Clonopin is a much different drug we'll talk about for anxiety for sure. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds much more likely. Anyway, um, 
But anyway, so looking at this, so then we have our uh, serotonergic neuron. Again, same thing happening here. By blocking the reuptake, either the CERT transporter or through a norepinephrine transporter here, you're going to find that the levels in the synapse are higher, and that's where we think we're going to get most of our effects from, right? Um, those here are monoamine oxidase inhibitors. will inhibit this enzyme monoamine oxidase. This will be important in neurology when we talk about uh, Parkinson's as well. We'll talk about that later. But um, basically, you're preventing the breakdown of the, the neurotransmitters, so they're more available, more of them eventually get out to the synapse, okay? Kind of getting the same action just through a different sort of mechanism there okay anyway so generally what we're shooting for is enhancing the norepinephrine serotonin effects that's what we're going for but the full mechanism don't know just know that it's going to take some time usually a few weeks before it really kind of kicks in so starting off with the monoamine oxidase inhibitors these are actually drugs you're not going to see used too too frequently unless you maybe have a patient who's been on it for like 40 or 50 years and their providers like been practicing since on or like the time of i don't know uh who's a famous old physician from like Greek times. Um, Hippocrates? Hippocrates, maybe it was go with that. I don't even know if he actually was <laughs> one, but he had an apnea after him, so that's got to work. Um, anyway, so let's say, yeah, so the very old providers like still use this occasionally, but not used to too, too, too commonly. We'll find there is one that we use in Parkinson's with some regularity though, so we'll talk about that later. But basically, um, they, they started out as an anti-tuberculosis drug actually, but they found that when they gave it to these patients who had tuberculosis, all of a sudden they didn't really mind that they had tuberculosis so much. They've actually felt a little better, and so they found they had some antidepressant effects, right? So from then, we had three main uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors that came about from that. We had phenylzine, we had isocarboxazine, and then tranylcypramine. Again, these are very old drugs for the most part. Um, and so what they find is these are irreversible inhibitors of monoamine oxidase A and B. They're not selected for either one, but they're irreversible inhibitors. So what do you think that means as far as the duration of action of these drugs? Long, okay. So is that a good thing or a bad thing? Depends. Okay, good. Depends is a good answer. Depends on what? Side effects, so they're having side effects, they're going to be very prolonged, right? So, okay, that could be a problem. What else? They don't want to get off of it. They may, the duration of effect may last for long. The thing to consider as well with antidepressants is because they have such a high rate of patients uh, stopping therapy abruptly, you have to worry about withdrawal symptoms, okay? They can have rebound effects. They have rebound anxiety. They can have um, sweating, tachycardia. They feel miserable. It's usually due to the levels of the drug dropping too fast. So if you had someone who was going off of this uh, cold turkey, that irreversible effect could actually be good, right? So we'll look at that uh, as well in some of the SSRIs. But again, um, this is more often than not a negative thing because of the fact that once those drugs are around, even if you took them off of it, they still have that effect around for two weeks. We're going to find there's some big uh, interactions here we have to worry about. Now, one thing to note is this is affecting both uh, serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine to some degree. Um, but here as well, it's going to be interacting with Tyramine. Anyone know what tyramine is? Mm -hmm. It's some wine. Red, uh, H cheese is red wine. Not red cheese, right? Yeah. Um, never had a red cheese, but. Uh, anyway, so basically what happens is, is you get this uh, amino acid called tyramine into your diet. Tyramine is a precursor to norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine. So if I am increasing the supply side of tyramine and then I'm preventing the breakdown of those monoamines, Guess what happens? You get a whole lot of norepinephrine, and a whole lot of serotonin. This is where you can see risk for side effects, right? So we call these a tyramine reaction, okay? And I'll show you a list of drugs here and just a, or substances that kind of fit into that. Yes, ma'am? It could result into serotonin syndrome, and that, that we'll talk about for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so anyway, so again, the, the more common ones you may run into include phenylzine, tranylcypramine, and then selegiline is this transdermal product we actually use in um, uh, Parkinson's. But we'll talk about that in neurology later on. So again, the adverse effects you're going to find, because you're dysregulating norepinephrine uh, use, you find that postural hypotension tends to be very common, which again is bad in older patients because of falls. Absolutely good. You're going to see some weight gain. You're going to see sexual side effects from this. So typically either manifesting as decreased libido, could be anorgasmia. Now for some patients, you may find that they're so depressed that they don't really respond well to like external stimuli. So that could be a reason why um, their libido is kind of decreased. And so in some cases, you may find that the antidepressants, as they treat their depression, they may actually help their libido out, right? So again, not everyone's going to act the same with this, but just be aware that this could be a potential side effect. And, and let them know to be aware of that. That's a normal thing. And it may not be, uh, it could be a reason why you discontinue the drug and go to something else, okay? Now, the big problem here is this hypertensive crisis that can develop, right? If you have a lot of tyramine coming in through your diet, 
and they have one of these monoamine oxidase inhibitors on board, you're going to develop very severe hypertension. You can develop, you know, headache, nausea, vomiting, stiff, all that uh, stiff neck, all that good stuff you see with like hypertensive crisis, right? Um, you have to be really careful of. And so I'll talk about the, the substances that can do that. But any drugs that also interact with serotonin or norepinephrine could interact with this as well, right? So again, if they were taking, say, for instance, uh, amphetamines for ADHD, if they were taking other antidepressants, if they were anything like that, um, herbal supplements for depression, this can interact with that and potentially cause this hypertensive crisis, okay? And again, the effect could be around for two weeks because it takes time for you to generate new monoamine oxidase. This could be a big problem you see with that. And basically, you just treat with antihypertensives. You know, if they are very severe and they're in the ER, treat them with things like nitroglycerin, nicardipine, all those kind of drugs we've talked about before to help get the blood pressure down. Anyway, so the drugs that, or the substances that typically have a lot of tyramine in it include, and I call these the, the bougie foods, um, and typically it's stuff like your, your more well-to-do patients may be participating in, in eating like aged cheeses and, um, you know, uh, red wines and things like that, you know, processed aged meats, things like MSG. Um, so these are a lot of stuff that are going to have, have high tyramine. I mean, you get MSG from anywhere, right? So you get that from pretty cheap food, too. But, um, again, that's what I, I like to think about. So, and, and anyone like a famous movie character that would have been really bad if they had been on a monoamine oxidase inhibitor? He liked fava beans with a nice Chianti. Oh, yeah. Hannibal Lecter, right? Actual Hannibal Lecter, who was a psychotherapist himself. Should not have been on a monoamine oxidase inhibitor because also he ate people, but whatever. So anyway, so just be aware of some of the foods that are more commonly associated with high tyramine and how they're going to interact with the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, okay? Know what that interaction looks like. Um, other medications, amphetamines, appetite suppressants, uh, you know, medications we have for asthma like albuterol, cocaine, any of these can interact and potentially cause this hypertensive crisis. So be very aware of that. Okay, so then moving into the TCAs, these are actually derivatives of the phen uh, uh, phenothiazines, which are actually antipsychotic medications. We'll talk about that later on in the section here. But basically, what they're doing is they're going to be inhibiting reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine. And typically, these were first line therapy. So by the time we had the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, eventually TCAs came out, and they were first line therapy for a good long time. They're very, very dangerous in overdose, though. And so, and I hear about um, some of my, my mentors in toxicology working like up in New York, in uh, New York City back in the 80s. They had beds, they were just set up for these TCA patients who are coming in overdosing uh, because you knew they come in, they get intubated and have to go up to the ICU. A lot of them died because of the uh, overdose can be so severe with these. But, um, but again, side effect profile, the therapeutic index, not great for these drugs here. But they're still used occasionally, uh, usually in lower doses, oftentimes for things like for insomnia, right? Especially with a lot of uh, providers like nurse practitioners and PAs for a while in Florida, guess what you couldn't prescribe? Controlled substances, right? Stuff for sleep is all controlled substances typically. So if you could do something else that was sedating that you can get around that without having to go bother your attending or if they didn't want to prescribe that, this could be good options, right? So something like TCA is still used occasionally for sleep. And then also you're going to find for neuropathic pain, as we talked about in the pain management section, you can use these as well. That reuptake inhib inhibition of norepinephrine helps with the neuropathic pain. So if you see patients like fibromyalgia or MS or any of these other things, diabetic neuropathies, TCAs might be on their list because of that, okay? Anyway, so the available agents include things like amoxapine, amitriptyline, clomipramine, disipramine, doxepin, amipramine, and then nortriptyline. So quite a few of them are available, right? They've been around for a while. Um, the more common ones I run into include amitriptyline, probably doxepin, amipramine, and then nortriptyline. Uh, nortriptyline. Those are the more common ones I run into typically. But just be aware of any of these. If you see them on a test, you'll be able to recognize that it's a TCA, right? So the adverse effects, other receptors are going to be interacting with include the, uh, the fact that they're anti-muscarinic. What's a mnemonic for anti-muscarinic? Mad as a hatter, red as a bee, dry as a bone. Hot as a hair, right? Tachycardic, right? They get very, uh, very tachycardic. What happens to their GI tract? Constipation, slowing everything down, right? That's another big problem we ran into with overdoses of these drugs. If it slows down the GI tract. And I have a bunch of pills sitting there in the stomach, and all of a sudden they start to get a little better. As the guts start to wake up, guess what all that, those pills do? Then they get reabsorbed later on. And we end up seeing kind of a recurrence of symptoms, right? It can be a big problem. The other big thing to note here as well is that, yes, you'll be tachycardic, but it also has sodium channel blocking effects on the heart. So if you think back to your one, class 1 antiarrhythmics, how they block sodium channels, this actually does the same thing and can prolong that QRS. And actually, that's one of the big things we look for on the EKG. If they have a certain prolonged QRS, then we know they're more likely to develop ventricular dysrhythmias, and they're more likely to develop uh, seizures because of this. So again, very dangerous drugs, but uh, can still be used occasionally, especially in those low doses. Um, other things you can find, they cause alpha receptor blockade. So alpha-1 blocking does what? 
hypotension, right? Because you're going to find that vasodilation occurs because of that. They're also going to cause sexual dysfunction through the normal course, uh, weight gain, and they also have uh, antihistamine effects, which kind of goes along with the antimuscarinic effects, which means you're going to find a lot of sedation with these as well, which is why we like to use it for, um, for sleep, right? One other indication you may see this used for, for children, actually, is actually for bedwetting. What do you think that might be the case? Sedating, and it dries them out, right? It actually has some anti-muscarinic effects to cause urinary retention. So if you had someone who is having bedwetting issues, this could actually be a good option for them, right? Um, why does it cause weight gain? Hmm? Why does it cause weight gain? Um, usually, you're going to find by anticholinergic, you tend to find some weight gain associated with those. Maybe with sedation, you're not moving around as much, you know, things like that. And in fact, especially like the SSRIs, like you find some patients that either, because um, again, with depression, do people undereat or overeat? They can do both, right? Some people just don't eat at all. Some people eat way too much when they're depressed. And then when they get on these medications, some of them are going to undereat, some of them are going to overeat. So it just depends. Uh, every patient's going to be a little, little different. Typically, though, more often with these, you end up seeing some weight gain associated with it. Yeah. Anyway, so then now we have our SSRIs. These are the gold standard treatment for depression that we have nowadays. Okay. So basically what they're doing is they're very specific. They don't block alpha receptors. They don't have anticholinergic properties. They don't do any of the other stuff that TCAs do but they block reuptake of serotonin. So very, very specific for their actions here, right? Which means that the therapeutic index has done what? Gone up or down? Gone a lot bigger, right? We have a lot bigger distance between the therapeutic dose and the toxic and then the lethal dose, right? TCA is a lot more narrow. and This is much, much more wide because of that. So again, first line therapy, much safer in overdose, typically more tolerable as well because they are so specific for their action. So the agents we have here include citalopram. We have escitalopram. So you notice that... In, uh, that uh, family uh, connection there, right? Escitalopram is the enantiomer of citalopram. Citalopram is that racemic mixture, right? So be aware of that. Um, that'll be important because there's uh, specific side effects you'll see with those two. Um, we have fluoxetine, which is Prozac, probably the first kind of big name SSRI that came out. We have fluvoxamine, paroxetine, and then sertraline. Okay, those are the main SSRIs you're going to run into. So um, basically what you're going to find is they have very low activity at all these other receptors. Um, so they have less weight gain associated with them than you do with your TCAs or your MAOIs. Uh, and then the most common side effects you're going into include some GI upset, which you expect to see, um, sexual disturbances for sure, headache, and then some insomnia. Okay. So very well tolerated for the most part. Now be aware, you have to be careful with patients who are going to uh, abruptly discontinue therapy because they are going to have this kind of serotonin withdrawal sort of effect where they get very anxious, they have sleep disturbances, all these things. So what do you do? Like, How do you make sure a patient does not have these uh, withdrawal symptoms? You can taper it down over a couple of weeks. That's definitely one thing you can do, right? So especially like imagine um, you know, I knew a few patients who they wanted to become pregnant, but they're on SSRIs and they did not want to have that exposure to the baby. So they had to build in a taper prior to them wanting to conceive and get pregnant, right? So that's something you can do to try to um, you know, limit the drug effects of fetus potentially, right? We'll talk about postpartum depression later on, how some of the patients need to be on SSRIs, but beyond what we're talking about here. Anyway, what else could you do though? What if the patient is not gonna be forthright with you and tell you when they're gonna stop therapy? Well, by using something with a longer half-life or something that has active metabolites, it has a much nicer taper on the level than you would see with, say, another SSRI that does not have that. So, for instance, imagine I had a patient looking at the drug levels over time. Uh, if you had a patient who was, say, on a normal, say, citalopram or something that did not have a lot of active metabolites or a long half-life, the drug levels, when they stopped taking it, would typically go down pretty precipitously. And that's where you see the withdrawal, right? Versus if I was using something like uh, Prozac, which has active metabolites, good long half-life, you'd see that they stop therapy. You'd find that it has a much more kind of nice natural sort of taper effect to it. And you mitigate a lot of those withdrawal effects. Okay, so if you're concerned about compliance issues, Prozac is usually going to be a better option for those patients. So fluoxetine is a good option for them. Okay. Um, now, again, uh, the anxiety symptoms for some people, it may be actually worse with SSRIs. Typically, though, it is improved, which is nice. Um, and then one other thing to note here as well, look out for QT prolongation, specifically with citalopram and escitalopram. Okay. Again, is it going to cause torsades by itself? Probably not. But have I seen certainly some QT prolongation, especially in overdose? You see with therapeutic doses, maybe 10 milliseconds or something, but certainly overdose, see patients come in. You know, what's a normal QTC? 440, 440, 440 milliseconds, a little bit longer for females. Um, but, you know, if you combine this with, say, the antipsychotic they were on, combine this with something else, the problem is QT is certainly come in over 600, definitely at risk for, for torsades, right? So you should be wary of that, okay? All right. Um, again, the black box warning for suicidality goes to any of these classes here. So MAOIs, TCAs. 
SSRIs, any of the um, kind of um, miscellaneous ones we're going to talk about, all have that same black box warning. So be very aware of that, especially in children and adolescents. They tend to have the higher risk overall, right? Um, and again, why is that? Mainly the akathisia we kind of talked about, just that kind of that increased energy, but your depression is still just as bad as it was the day before, right? Um, in some patients, though, it can actually lead to more manic episodes your bipolar patients, right? So again, we'll talk about bipolar disorder next time, but um, essentially, you know, you have to kind of treat both components of it, the, the manic side of things and the depression. Sometimes the patient was coming in and they're in the depressive phase, uh, this can actually lead to more of a manic phase. We'll talk about that later. So um, some other ones, some SNRIs. Now these you're gonna find certainly used for depression, but also for neuropathic pain. So anything that has a norepinephrine reuptake inhibition, good for neuropathic pain, okay? Um, and so again, these are nice because they don't have the same kind of um, receptor activity like a TCA does. They don't have really anti-muscarinic activity. They don't get a lot of those effects. They're very specific for serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibition, right? So the ones we have here include venlafaxine, we have desvenlafaxine. Again, you see that relationship between those two. There's duloxetine, um, uh, milnociprine, and then levomilnociprine. Again, you see that relationship between those two there. Probably the more common ones you run into are going to be duloxetine, venlafaxine, and desvenlafaxine. Those are the three I've seen probably most commonly. Now, what might you expect to see with these drugs? Um, you know, with certainly some nausea GI disturbances, probably a little bit higher than SSRIs, mainly due to that norepinephrine effect. What do you think it does to blood pressure? It's probably going to go up, right? More norepinephrine out in the synapse probably is going to cause your blood pressure to go up. So if I had told you you had a patient who is, you know, on three different antihypertensives, blood pressure still 150 over, you know, 100, you know, which uh, SSRI or which you know, antidepressant medication would you want to put them on? And I give you an MAOI, that probably wouldn't be good, right? Because again, that can cause some blood pressure increases because it affects norepinephrine. Um, you know, but desvenlafaxine, that would be a good option, but maybe something like sertraline would be okay because it's just affecting serotonin, right? So you'd be looking for that sort of thing. Um, and again, you'll still find sexual dysfunction with the SNRIs that's certainly still present with these as well. Okay, so up next we have some mixed serotonergic agents here. So uh, trazodone and nifazodone. Nifazodone we're not really used because it has some hepatic issues, but trazodone you certainly will see um, used pretty commonly. This is another one that's very sedating that we I found uh, a lot of nurse practitioners and PAs were writing for, uh, for sleep. Uh, before you guys had the ability to write for uh, controlled substances here in Florida. So that's something you may still see used occasionally. Um, so what it's doing is it does work on serotonin reuptake inhibition, but also as, acts as an antagonist to the 5-HT2 receptors. That'll be really important when we talk about schizophrenia later on, um, but just know it has some mixed activity there. Um, the big thing to note with these is that they also will cause alpha receptor blockade, which means you're going to see hypotension, right? The other kind of unique thing you can see with trazodone is priapism. And again, we talked about urology. Why do you think you see priapism? Remember, when you have an erection, it's mainly due to differences in the blood coming in and the blood coming out. If I have extra blood coming in because I'm vasodilating, guess what? You see priapism. How do you treat priapism? You can drain it. What else? You can actually use phenylephrine. You can actually use a drug that acts at the alpha receptors to cause vasoconstriction. So you have intracavernosal Phenylephrine you can administer to actually cause vasoconstriction and decrease that blood flow coming in, right? So again, think about the mechanism for why the effect's happening and think about the drugs we can use to counteract that, right? Anyway, so I, I have seen that uh, occasionally, um, especially like, you know, trazodone overdoses, patients come in, you know, very sedate, but they, they had this priapism. And then it becomes not just a, a drug overdose issue, but now it becomes a urolo urologic issue as well, right? Because again, you can't find permanent damage done, um, you know, if you're not treat that, uh, you know, quickly enough, right? So anyway, so you can kind of interesting the things you'll see. Yes, ma'am. So are these increasing like parasympathetic? Hmm, not really. No. Okay. Yeah. Why would you think that? Um, um, the but mainly just due to the alpha okay, one maybe. receptor blockade. Yeah, that's all it is. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, and again, if you're avoiding narcotics, which means just controlled substances, then yeah, this oftentimes gets prescribed for sleep in a lot of cases. Okay. Uh, up next, we have bupropion. Now, we've talked about this one before. Where do we see this at? Smoking cessation, right? Why do it work for smoking cessation? Because it works with dopamine, right? Remember, dopamine is responsible for what? The reward pathway, right? So, again, think about those dopamine squirts you get when you, like, you know, wake up and you're like, all right, I got farm today. Woohoo. Right? You guys get the dope? No? Uh, okay, maybe not. Um, but if you have, like, you know, big juicy hamburger, you know, have sex, have heroin, whatever the case may be, whatever stimulates your dopamine, 
it's all on the spectrum, right? It's all, all along the spectrum. Anyway, um, the the thought here is it's trying to disrupt that that reward pathway essentially, right? So that way you don't get those same kind of cravings for your nicotine or your alcohol or whatever the case may be, right? So again, you can see it used for some of these kind of addiction um, and actually uh, overeating disorders. Bupropion is starting to now be used in combination with another drug called naltrexone. Right, it's kind of a cousin to naloxone, but anyway. Um, but so this is working on the reuptake of norepinephrine, but primarily dopamine is the other big one here. And so the nice thing about this one is it has the least amount of sexual dysfunction out of all the antidepressants. So if you had a patient who had sexual dysfunction on an SSRI, your program is a pretty good option to switch them over to. Okay, it's one of kind of the claims to fame for this one. Be aware though, especially in overdose, bupropion can be really, really nasty as far as causing cardiac dysrhythmias. It can also cause seizures as well. Okay. So be very careful with this one in overdose if you had a patient who were kind of really concerned about them being a, a big risk for that. Right? SSRIs would be certainly safer. Um, and again, in the overall hierarchy of things, probably SSRIs are probably the safest. SNRIs is probably a little less safe than that. Then you probably have like bupropion followed closely by the TCAs and MAOIs MOI, is kind of all of that kind of uh, at the bottom there. Right. So again, safety-wise, SSRIs are still going to be the best. Okay. So serotonin syndrome. What is serotonin syndrome? To too much serotonin, right? So when does that happen? Well, usually when you have blocking the reuptake of serotonin, or maybe I'm blocking the metabolism of serotonin. So imagine I were to say I have a patient being switched from uh, an MAOI and I'm putting them on an SSRI, but I didn't wait that two-week washout period, and so now they're working together, right? Or what did I tell you? There's an antibiotic that actually blocks monoamine oxidase. Remember that one's used for vancomycin resistant bugs. Linazolid, yeah. Linazolid actually has monoamine oxidase inhibiting capabilities. So if I had a patient who came in to the hospital, get treating for VRE, and they're on their antidepressants at home, and I didn't realize that, and I mixed the two together, guess what? Potential for serotonergic toxicity. So not everything that pops up is serotonin syndrome. Anything before that we call serotonergic toxicity, right? And again, very frequently, this is a hard diagnosis to make. We call this a diagnosis of exclusion. Anyone know what that means? Everything rule everything else out before you can call it serotonin syndrome, right? Because you don't want to jump the gun and say, oh, yeah, it's serotonin syndrome, and then miss the fact they have meningitis, right? There's a lot of things that this can look like. Um, and so the four hallmarks of serotonin syndrome include altered mental status, hyperthermia, autonomic instability. Anyone know what I mean by that? Yeah, hypertension, hypotension, tachycardia, bradycardia, somewhere around there, right? Their, their vital signs are going to be off, okay? And then usually increased muscle tone, right? This could be some muscle rigidity, or it could be clonus, especially in the lower limbs. Lower limbs tend to be more affected than the upper limbs. That's one of the things we'll actually look for to see if we can induce clonus uh, in, the, in the lower limbs for these patients, okay? They have those four, you could have a risk for serotonin syndrome. And again, you're looking for the history as well, okay? And what, you could, do, what could you do if like a patient came in uh, and they were manifesting these symptoms, but they weren't really coherent, they couldn't talk to you, and you had no idea what their medication list was? What could you do? Okay, yeah, so you can call it E4s, or you can look up E4s. Maybe they have some controlled substances they filled at, and then once you find the pharmacy they're at, call them up, right? They give you a full list. Or what could you do if you didn't have that? Break into their house. Break into their house, yep, you could do that. Think about, like, the site. Think about, like, what's happening and think about the site. Yeah, you can do that, too, but just to get the actual information, again, where do people normally fill their prescriptions at? Walgreens, CVS, Walmart, right? You can call them up, right? And just be like, hey, do you have this, have this patient here? Here's their date of birth. Here's their name. Do you have any information on them? And they'll help you out, right? Um, so again, always think about that. It takes a little extra time, but it could lead you to be like, oh, wow, they're on, they had a prescription for trazodone and they filled at the same time uh, they got their SSRI, you know, because again, they're seeing two different providers and went to one for sleep and they got trazodone and they had their citalopram on, right? These things happen, right? And they're seeing multiple providers. So that's one, one thing to consider. Um, and again, be very careful. This can be seen, especially with tyramine reactions with the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Anytime you're mixing any serotonergic drugs together, this can be a consequence. Yes, ma'am. Do you need to, like, if um, somebody is on, like, uh, tramadol or, like, methadone, do you need to worry about those? Yeah, they, you have to consider that as well, too, right? Yeah, yeah normal therapeutic dosing. So again, you mentioned tramadol and methadone, both of which have some serotonin or have norepinephrine reuptake inhibiting capabilities. Um, yeah, you have to worry about that, right? Especially in overdose, right? Maybe not as big of an effect at, um, you know, in therapeutic doses, but before you get to serotonin syndrome, you can still have some of these serotonergic toxicities, right? You can have the sweating, you can have um, some hypertension, you can have that clonus that can develop, right? Um, so again, there's a spectrum there before they get into full-blown sort of serotonin syndrome. But very good uh, point there. Those are other medications you would not think of being depression meds that can be interacting here, okay? Um, so how do you, how would you treat this, right? So if you have a patient who's hyperthermic, what do you do? 
you try Tylenol, but for something like this, this is it's gonna be like uh, you know, throwing a you know, using a rubber band gun for you know, trying to kill somebody, right? Cold water. How are you gonna give them cold water? The what? The chambers. Yeah, so that's one they call that evaporative cooling, right? So you can strip them down, spray them down with water, and put a fan on them, right? That'll evaporate that water and take a lot of heat with it. What else could you do? Cooled IV fluids, right? Usually, most ERs you're going to find there somewhere where they have cold IV fluids you can infuse into them. What else? Do some ice packs, right? Put the ice packs in the axilla, the groin. That's also a good ways to do it, right? Because, so, again, sometimes you run into patients, especially like some of these um, amphetamine based products that will overdose on, they'll come in up at temperature 104, 105, basically cooking the brain. Get, uh, sometimes I've seen cases up to like 107, some cases, right? Um, get them in, cool them down. That's usually the best way we can do that, right? Um, and then we also have a drug called ciproheptadine. It's actually uh, an antihistaminic drug, but um, it has some serotonin blocking capabilities. We can actually administer that, uh, and that can help out some, in some cases too. Okay. So, um, again, when you're trying to consider what drugs to use for your patients, again, consider things with long half-lives or things with active metabolites for patients who are going to be more prone to be um, likely to go off of therapy without really telling you anything about it, right? So, phylloxetine is a really good one for that for patients with compliance issues. Um, Again, if they're on it for longer, typically they have some body burden of it built up, so that way they can kind of help with some of those withdrawal symptoms. But I've seen some patients who miss a single dose, and they get, like, super cranky, and they're uh, really just kind of agitated, and they're sweating. They're like, what the heck's going on? And oh, yeah, I forgot to take my Zoloft, or whatever the case may be, right? So those are things you want to consider as well. Those withdrawal symptoms can pop up pretty quick for drugs with short half-lives, okay? And, again, a lot of these drugs are um, going to be metabolized through the liver, so at least watch out for patients with liver dysfunction that can uh, extend the half-lives of them, okay? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, some of the TCA, or as far as drug interactions go, some of the TCAs are going to be um, metabolized through SIP enzymes. Just look it up. I'm not going to have you memorize every single one of them. One of the um, caveats I'll, I will point out is that when you're thinking about medications either for the heart or for the head, I think about SIP2D6 as being a common um, enzyme that's going to be responsible for that. So look up 3A4 interactions, look up 2D6 interactions whenever you're prescribing one of these drugs for these patients. Um, and again, with the TCAs, you know, they tend to be highly protein bound. So you could have something come along, knock it off, and then all of a sudden have those increased serotonergic effects, right? Um, and like I said, any drug that may affect serotonin can increase its toxicity here. So we mentioned linazolid. We talked about, um, uh, you know, uh, things like tramadol and methadone, certainly methylene blue. I actually saw one really cool case of serotonin mm -hmm. syndrome. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned it to you guys, but a patient was getting a high, uh, parathyroidectomy. And they use methylene blue to actually help. It gets preferentially uptake into the parathyroids. And so when they administer that, didn't realize the patient was also on antidepressant. In the middle of surgery, it gets hypertensive, it gets really diaphoretic, it starts to get acidotic. So, again, it can happen, right? Um, triptans, which we'll talk about when we get to talking about migraines a little bit later on, those can also uh, cause some issues here as well. Okay. And again, a lot of times the antidepressants need a few weeks to really wash out before you can really say, okay, all the effects are gone. Now, imagine you had a patient came into the ICU needing linazolid, but they're on. So Talipram at home, can I give them two to five weeks to wash out? No, I can't. Usually you can't wait. But you can at least monitor for symptoms, right? You can at least stop the citalopram and allow start the linazolid and at least monitor for symptoms. You can treat the hypertension, treat, you know, whatever else you need to. Okay. So this is something to consider. All right. Um, look out for the QT prolongation, especially with citalopram and escitalopram. This will be important when you're combining it with, say, other antiarrhythmics, or say, for instance, you had a patient who was on um, uh, antipsychotic. We'll talk much more about those later, so just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. And then most of these drugs have some degree of sedation, especially the TCAs, things like trazodones. When you mix them with other sedatives like alcohol or benzodiazepines, you're going to see some synergy there. And we'll talk more about the benzos when we get to the anxiety talk a little bit later. Okay. Now, St. John's War, who's heard of this one? What, is, what does it do? Or what do you use it for? Yeah, it's an antidepressant. It's an herbal supplement, though, right? Does it work? Yeah, it actually can work, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be anyone to, to discount the efficacy of herbal supplements. I might just say, you know, watch out and see where you're getting it from because it may not be the best quality. But um, certainly they can absolutely work. Um, and so they found St. John's Wort to be a good herbal supplement for more mild cases of depression. Um, and there's a lot of different active components to it. What they find is that it has uh, some degree of monoamine oxidase inhibiting capabilities um, and may have some ability to block the reuptake of some uh Mono means like, you know, serotonin, norepinephrine. So decent for, you know, mild to moderate depression. But again, if you have a patient who comes in and they're complaining of depressive symptoms and you prescribe them citalopram, but you didn't ask them about herbal supplements or, you know, they go home and they talk to their friend. They're like, oh, yeah, I got this drug for depression. And then they're like, oh, yeah, you should try some St. John's wort. And take the two together. 
that's where you can see that risk for serotonin uh, toxicity, okay? That's one big concern. The other big concern is this is actually a 3A4 and a PGP inducer. That means it's going to do what to your drug levels of interacting meds? They're going to go down, right? So again, you're going to find that uh, their metabolism is going to go up. The levels will go down, so you have to be aware of that. Watch, and, and again, where can you get St. John's wort from? I can go to Walmart, I can go to Walgreens, I can go to GNC, and pick it up anywhere. So it's widely available. You need to ask a question or at least warn them. You know, hey, I'm going to be putting you on this drug. Let's let you know, hey, you know, there's a lot of herbal supplements out there. Here's one to avoid, right? Here's one that may be safe to combine. The, and these are things you'll, you'll get a feel for as you go on. Okay, so again, typically for most patients, starting out with depression, start off with an SSRI, and you can move on from there, right? That's typically going to be the safest. Um, if they are having sexual dysfunction, consider bupropion. If, they're having, if they have neuropathic pain, consider an SNRI. You know, kind of go on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. MAOI should be last resort. Right? TCA should not be used typically, but they can be used occasionally. MAOIs really shouldn't be used most, uh, most any time. And then if they fail therapy, make sure, one, you actually had good compliance. So again, they come back in six weeks, and you're like, oh, yeah, have you been taking it? And they're like, oh, I take it every single day, and they stop taking it after a week, right? Um, you're not going to be able to really be able to tell that unless you get you know good history from them. So that can be difficult. But um, once you've assessed that they have adequate compliance, and they've had an adequate duration and dosing of the drug, they still failed, you can try switching it around, right? Just because they failed sertraline doesn't mean they're going to fail escitalopram, right? Now, if they failed citalopram, would I try escitalopram? That would be less likely to, because, again, they're so uh, structurally related. Uh, I'd be like, man, nah, that's probably not going to work too often. But certainly if they, you know, failed citalopram, good fluoxetine, anything like that. Um, so just to see how they're going to, to, to work with it. Um, and then it, Depending on what their other comorbid condition is, they may need some additional help. So if they have concomitant bipolar disorder, which again, depression is part of that bipolar disorder, they may need something like a, a, a mood stabilizer, like lithium. They may need some valproic acid or something we're going to talk about later on. Um, or they may need atypical antipsychotics, right? So we'll talk about those agents later, but just know they may need some additional medications based off of what kind of their other stuff is going on. Okay. So any questions on antidepressants? I know it's quick, but I want to make sure we have time to go over anything you guys had questions on because this is the end of the material for the test okay all the other behavioral stuff is going to be on the next test so any questions right now i will check the board and see